from where you sit, what's happening at the judiciary? My, my brother Ken, we have a, a very serious situation on our hands. What we must start by saying is this, that you know, there's a gentleman who is called Thomas Hobbes. He wrote that uh, human beings exist in a state that is different from what we call the state of nature. The state of nature is a place where life is brutish, nasty, and short. Now, we have come together and established for ourselves a constitution, especially the Constitution 2010, a social contract which is supposed to guide our conduct as Kenyans on every sphere. And then at the center of, of putting this fabric together, the national fabric together, is the judiciary. And the framers of the Constitution 2010 envisioned an independent judiciary uh, filled with people of serious integrity and um, of high qualification. And I believe that the judges of the Supreme Court qualify in every aspect with regard to the requirements of uh, the Constitution as far as their appointment is concerned. But now, lately, you have seen that there have been a plethora of cases in which the judges of the Supreme Court have rendered decisions and many people are not happy. Um, one of them was uh, the presidential election petition last year. Um, in which, uh, the year before last, in which uh, some sections of the population were not happy about how the judiciary rendered itself. Now, there have been another number of cases thereafter in which some lawyers and uh, litigants seem not to be very happy about. So, what am I saying? That in a situation such as ours, in a democracy that is working, in a situation in which the judiciary is supposed to be an independent arbiter, you expect to lose some cases and you expect to win some cases. Those are the so, rules. So those are the rules. Yes. However, we have seen a situation in which when some lawyers, especially in this country, do not win cases in the, in, in the courts, mm -hmm. they, they say that the reason they don't win the cases is because the judges are bad. Okay? But, when they but win, at the someone... same time, uh -huh. there have actually been cases in which standing and looking at the way judges have have conducted themselves in some of these cases, somebody is left wondering whether it is the law that was in application or it was something else. Now, be that as it may, something that we, we must guard against, this offensive, this wholesome offensive against the judiciary is becoming a very dangerous thing. The reason being, in a situation in which the people no longer trust the judiciary, then like what you are that. saying is that you are entertaining a situation in which the people out there will no longer believe that they can get help in the judiciary and they will resort to what we call self-help. When we get to that situation, mm -hmm. every body of us, including you and I, will For themselves. Cry. The problem is, uh, James, the precedence was set right at the top. When the top leadership of this country disrespected the judiciary and questioned the judiciary and warned the judiciary, what did you expect from the other people? Uh, th that's very important. Ken, let us, not, um, le let us not lose the conversation. The important thing to note is this. Every person has a right to disagree with the way the judges have, have conducted and probably rendered a decision in a certain matter. However, the way you react to the result of the decisions of the courts is supposed to be a measured, respectful, and very, very professional manner. So that you leave the judiciary intact to deliver judgments and to render uh, decisions in other cases tomorrow. So what am I saying here? Um, we have been in a situation in the last one and a half years in which every person wants to hit at the judiciary one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And I want to urge a lot of caution. I think this is the point in this, in this particular country, when we need to sit down and say, yes, the judiciary has challenges. Yes, the judiciary may have problems. And how do we deal with these problems? Do we bring the whole house down and leave nothing instead? Or do we methodically address the problems, the challenges that beset this judiciary? Okay, Steve, the same question. When the judiciary is vilified right at the top, I mean, if you, as a father of the house, shows some disrespect to your household, what do you expect of your children? I mean, Ken, uh, I'd have expected the president 
post the handshake to render unreserved apology for the kind of remarks that he made against the, the judiciary, which is a co-equal arm of government. He has no right in law to threaten an independent organ of government, just like the judiciary cannot threaten or emasculate the other arm of government, be it the, be it the, the legislature or the executive. So that needed to have been withdrawn and he needed to have apologized. He has not done so. Which then deepens the crisis of perception. What is the perception? There is a, there's a stubborn perception that the executive and the political elite are still open to manipulation of the judiciary. They can manipulate the judiciary by starving it of financial resources. They can manipulate the judiciary by conversing and patronizing those judges. They can manipulate the judiciary by outrightly threatening them and, you know, with, re with, with removal of proceedings through the JSC. They can, uh, uh, they can manipulate the judiciary by launching a serious smear campaign that is intended or calculated to delegitimize the entire judiciary. And I want Kenyans to understand this. We have risks that are external to the judiciary and you have risks that are internal to the judiciary. The Constitution deals with both. Threats that are external to the judiciary, all Kenyans must stand united and guard against. External political in, in, uh, interference or influence, the Constitution has rejected that. And what the President said, for all intents and purposes, was an attempt to influence judicial thinking in the future. And we reject that as false. The threats that are internal to the judiciary is what is supposed to be subjected to review through Judicial Service Commission. You know, threats that are internal to the judiciary means that a judge that is supposed to be independent and impervious to external manipulation or influence makes himself available, you know, willingly to conduct himself in a manner that is not consistent with that, with, I mean, with that office. If a Kenyan believes that a judge has done something, you know, which is inconsistent with that office, of course it's open to him to petition. As James has said, I urge caution and restrain. Do not corner, do not be cornered, you know, to just file petitions <coughs> against, the, against judges of the Supreme Court or even any other judge just because you know the Constitution permits it because of the deleterious effect in the long run that will have in terms of preserving mm -hmm. the credibility and integrity and the place of the judiciary in our constitutional design and architecture. Okay. Okay. Number, okay. Number, number two, just hold on, just hold on, okay, uh, uh, James. Number two, judges themselves, when they are held to account, they must not neglect or ignore those concerns. Because when, when the JSC considers, this is a two-step process, when you file a petition with the JSC, the JSC forms a committee to consider the merits of this petition. If the JSC considers that this petition is frivolous and unmerited, it will dismiss it. Mm -hmm. If the JSC considers that this petition raises significant questions, then it will give you time to answer to it. In the case of J.B. Ojuang, the JSC committee made a report that some of these issues that are raised in the petition, the learned judge needed to appear in person to be able to attend to them. He had sent his laws. Of course, it's open to you to be represented through your counsel. But once the commission makes a determination that your, your personal presence or attendance is yes, indispensable, yes, I mean, you cannot circumvent that. If you circumvent that, you risk not only in subordination <coughs> of your employer, which is, the J, which is the JSC, but you also risk sending the wrong signal to the public. You know, as a judge, you're supposed to be of some, someone of impeachable or impeccable conduct and impeachable integrity. Your integrity, your conduct, I mean, and demeanor and attitude must in totality show respect and honor to the office of the judge. <coughs> because you'll be sitting in review of decisions that are near similar to yours. Okay. If you set a bad example or a bad president, by neglecting or refusing or declining to attend someone's. How will you protect someone's rights who is before you, who has come to claim that he was, he was someone and they never attended, now that he's been fired and needs protection? This is the kind of communication that I find problematic. Okay. So the issue of <coughs> J.B. Ojuang, mm -hmm. not attending the JSC uh, sittings, as has been someone, has now forced the JSC to otherwise move it the next step of advising the president to establish a tribunal. tribunal. Okay. But Kenyans, the summary... Which will they, still do yes, the same thing, yes, yes. we just investigate him. Exactly. These are just allegations. Yeah. yeah, but what I don't agree with you is that you're saying that his rights to representation are suspended because he's merely been summoned by the JC. That's no, what you're no, saying. No, 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 no. Let me clarify. Yes. Can, can you have a right... The, yes, just just hold on. making this uh, a monologue uh -huh. between, uh, <laughs> between Steve and himself. 
uh, there are some things that we must uh, uh, we, we must rectify. And the first one is this: mm -hmm. there is nothing that prohibits any person from from objectively criticizing the judiciary. Yes. Once the judiciary has rendered a decision, it is open to scholars, it is open to politicians, it is to, uh, open to the president to criticize if they think that there is a point they can make, a fair point they can make about the process and about the result of that process, which is a decision or a judgment. And I want to say this. The president of the Republic of Kenya is the head of state of the nation. And he sits in a place in which he receives a lot of information, including very fine intelligence on a lot of things, okay? And if he has good reason to believe, for instance, that there is something that is not so good at the other arm of government, which is the judiciary, he has every reason, he has every right to point out that, hey, David Ju Justice, uh, Chief Justice David Maraga, I have information that your side has a problem. I have a problem with my side. I'm trying to work on it. But there is also a problem on your side, okay? That is not a problem. And then on the other hand, we must understand this. The Chief Justice should not think that when he is under pressure from the executive or the, the, the legislature, that he must give in. In fact, my advice to the Chief Justice is, you don't have to be a friend of the executive. You do not have to be a friend of the legislature. You must always be independent. You, they don't have to like you, okay? So long as you make sure that what you are doing is right. So I do not see a problem with the president pointing out any problem that he might think exists in the judiciary, and I do not see any problem in the judiciary maintaining its position if it thinks it is right in the way it's Expl doing things. Explain to me this. Yes. Explain to me this. The consistency in the attacks. Then we have a budget that cuts down the development budget of the judiciary. The CJ has to go out to the media to defend and ask for more money. They hold a symposium. They are added that money. We see a budget review, a supplementary budget, and they are added that money. And then we hear the consistent attack by politicians, right? How don't you, how can you, how can you not justify that indeed these sentiments were geared towards uh, channeling his thinking in a particular now way? Now I'm coming to that. And that's what I'm saying. When you rise to the position of the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. You should understand that this is an office that is going to be set with many challenges, including the first and most biggest threat to the judiciary, mm -hmm. which is other arms of government trying to claw into the independence of the judiciary. However much noise the politicians might make, however much noise but it lawyers, our lawyers, it might, our yeah, la lawyers might make, yes. However much noise lawyers might make, however much lawyer noise um, politicians might make, the judiciary should stick to operating under the constitution and the law. And then, most importantly, thinking and perception is a question of communication. And what, one thing I'm sure about, which I can tell you today, is that I have a very strong feeling that the communication, the strategic communication aspect of the judiciary is extremely down. I expect the chief justice to create a serious communication team which is able to give us information correctly on some of the allegations that some of these people out there are making. The Chief Justice cannot expect that he is the only person who is going to be reading statements. Who speaks on behalf who, of the Who speaks on behalf of the, have a CRJ, the judiciary. Uh, exactly. Yes. But then most importantly, the second question. Um, when you have a specific petition that has come to the Judicial Service Commission on the conduct of a judge under Article 167 or 168. What we must resist as Kenyans is this mob justice mentality in which we say that just because there is a petition against Ken Mijung, mm -hmm. then this man is at fault and we must condemn him. Yeah. I want to say this and urge caution. The learned judge, Jackton Bomo Ojuang, does not, uh, does not have to appear before JSC to answer any question. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Constitution allows him uh, to send a representative. They don't even have to be his lawyers. Mm -hmm. He can even send someone he trusts who can speak on his behalf to answer those questions. And I think what they should have done is tell the counsel that appeared before him, before them, that you know, we have more questions okay. for the good judge. Okay. Can you go and get Asking, more yeah. and further instructions okay. on some of these questions you and then come back to us? Yeah, you disagree with Stephen this, this and I also hold, hold your position. Hold he doesn't have to do it. Yes. Yes. Let's have a settled discussion. 
so that the viewers can know what is already settled and what instead of having a conflated approach. Number one, the issue is this. Based on the law, mm -hmm. looking at Article 159 of the Constitution, what does the law say? It says the judiciary derives its power from the people. There is a marked difference between the judiciary as we know it today and the judiciary pre-2010. And based on the fact that the judiciary is a co-equal arm of government, the president or the speaker or any other person cannot dictate how the other arm of government can operate. And therefore, there, is, there cannot be any clever argument that excuses the president for those remarks that he made of revisiting. We reject it as false, based on the constitution. If he has refused to apologize and withdraw, that's fine. That's fine. But the fact of the matter is settled by the law. The judiciary is now a co-equal arm of government, and that must be recognized and must be respected. The second issue. The Constitution itself says... You know, you know, I'm just wondering why you had to say that, because that's settled. That's I mean, not settled. It, 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 it's, 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 it's not, you know, it should James, happen, but it's not James, happening. Still, James, hold on, James, hold on. No, still James, 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 you've already spoken. Yes, that is the obvious. No, yes. no yeah. he's spoken and, and he had re-established that point. But if it is settled, that's mm. where... That's, where that's settled. That's number, settled. Number two, but it's not happening. Yes, it's not happening. It's not happening, but it's how it should be. Number two, if you look at Article 160, sub-Article 5, the Constitution says what you can do what you can't do in respect of judges. It says a judge cannot, you cannot commence civil or criminal proceedings or any other proceedings against an action of a judicial, against the action of a judicial officer done in good faith during the performance of his judicial functions. Mm -hmm. To that extent, the constitution protects judges from unnecessary attack or witch hunt or maybe trying to threaten them externally. So because of that assurance, Judges are at liberty to apply the law as they know it. Number three, which is now the substance, I think, of what we are discussing now, under Article 168, the procedures for removal. One of those procedures for removal includes gross misconduct and incompetence. You get, if you can demonstrate gross, in, gross misconduct or incompetence on the part of a judge, in, in meaning the judge has, has rendered a determination that assessed generally does not achieve a certain threshold, and I agree on this for people who have criticized the judiciary on that on, in terms of jurisprudence, you know the fact of the matter is this. Supreme Court judgments should not be open to ridicule or even crit uh, or criticism even by a first, first year law student. The, the judgment by the Supreme Court should be right either way. If you look at the dissenting opinion, the majority opinion, it should be solid, it should be tight. If judges have a, develop a casual approach to developing jurisprudence and determination, then of course that could speak to the level of the question of, in, of incompetence. And JSC is merited in examining that question. We are not sure whether some of these questions re relating to the competence of judges are lying before or pending before the JSC, but that's a ground. In terms of incompetence, in terms of improper conduct, which I think is what most of these judges are facing and corruption, these ones, the Constitution already no, allows misconduct. Yes, uh, the Constitution uh, already allows mm. any member of the public or even the JSC acting on its own motion to investigate. But what I want us to settle is this: the fact that the Constitution has opened opportunities for deepening judicial accountability does not mean that we abuse those processes. Okay. If we abuse those processes, in the long run, you'll have a judiciary that does not command the respect, the kind of, respect you deserve. of Kenyans, and when we need the judiciary mm. to make a determination on matters that are so sensitive and important to the nation, such as the presidential election petition, and as James said and I agree, you will find people who are no longer re who are not, who are reluctant to approach that court because that court has been bastardized, it has been delegitimized, it has been decampaigned over four years, and therefore, although the court is there and has powers under the constitution mm. to receive and determine presidential election petition nobody will go there yeah, so okay. let us exercise none will trust the outcome that is none the point trust. okay I, i'm still on article 168 and, yes. and my question to you before i go to um james is what's happening to philomena Moelu? why did they have to throw her in court there's a procedure of removal or when, when allegations and you see they really insisted exactly. and taken her through the procedure of the court why didn't they just allow this to go through the normal petition to the judicial service commission these are the things that uh, worry people observing and in the know. And, that, and I agree with you. In terms of courtesy between offices, courtesy and committee between offices, the office of the deputy, the office, the office of the director of public prosecution, of course, is an independent office. It can prefer charges against any other person that he thinks 
he thinks ev there's evidence that can support those charges. But I've argued before that when you're preferring charges against someone, the second in command at the judiciary, someone in the person of the deputy chief justice, when there's another procedure, you know, for mm -hmm. disciplinary and action or even for removal, strategically it would have been better, you know, to stay prosecution, allow JSC to consider mm -hmm. this petition on removal because mm -hmm. the thing is this, if the DPP has evidence that can lead to prosecution, whether that prosecution will eventually give us a conviction or not, mm -hmm. the fact that he has evidence, that evidence, if in his own assessment, can sustain a prosecution, then it means that the threshold for removal is almost, almost certainly t achieved. T t tell me something. Yes. Can the DCI or the DPP also frame it in form of a petition that is then handed over? to the Judicial Service Commission or they have to go uh, through the court process? Is it possible just in one word? Not, well, technically, yes, mm -hmm. but I would not advise the DPP to go that way. Mm -hmm. The DPP, knowing that he has assessed the evidence available, he can choose to initiate prosecution almost immediately, but I'm okay. saying mm -hmm. nothing stops the DPP from relating, relaying that information to the Judicial to the Service JSC, Commission. Okay. JSC to consider, okay. and if it's merited, mm -hmm require you know, initiate a tribunal mm -hmm. to facilitate the removal of this of the dcj and then you're prosecuting a retired dcj rather than prosecuting a serving dcj, DCJ. I technically agree with you. it's possible yeah, yeah. but in terms of preserving the committee of officers mm -hmm. and the overall impact mm -hmm. on the integrity of the judiciary that may put the judiciary in a very precarious position okay then the other question that comes up uh, james is the fact that probably the judiciary has given us all the reasons to doubt them and uh, that is uh, not to be unexpected because the judiciary deals with several thousands of cases every year, touching on various questions. They could be political, they could be environmental, they could be social, family, or other forms of, 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 of disputes. And this is what all of us must always understand. The people who win cases will be happy. The people who lose cases aren't going to be happy. And I can give you the example between the state and accused persons. Take the example of the case of DCJ Mwilu. You see, when DCJ Mwilu is brought to court, the parties there are the state versus DCJ Mwilu. Okay? The state is only represented by the director of public prosecutions. Now, when this matter comes before the courts, the courts have to deal with that matter on the basis of the evidence that has been presented before it. Nothing else. Our courts are not courts of conscience. They are not courts of public opinion. They are not courts of emotion. They are courts of law and courts of evidence. So if this matter be brought before the courts and DCJ Mwilu runs to another court and establishes beyond... Uh, and establishes before that other court that you know what is happening in the criminal court against me is wrong. It should be stayed. That other court will have no option but to agree with her and give her an order saying stay those other proceedings. When that happens, either party losing or winning whatever aspect of the war or the battle at that particular point shouldn't be happy. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to emphasize something extremely important the President of the Republic of Kenya has a right to tell the judiciary that you know we feel that you are the problem in the fight against corruption. But the judiciary has also a corresponding right to tell the President that we have cases that have been brought here and that this is the position. In fact, I, I dare say that the judiciary should be telling the executive that you have brought these many cases. Out of these many cases, some of these cases, their files could not be processed because the police file was lacking or because the prosecution was not ready and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Instead of just clinging to that high principle that the judiciary is independent and therefore you cannot talk to us. Okay? So what am I saying here? Kenyans should understand that as my friend Steve has said, this constitutional dispensation has opened up opportunities of accountability to whatever level. That's why CSS are being dragged to in investigation and, and so on and so forth. That's why every Kenyan, including the first year law student you talked about, is now um, allowed to criticize Supreme Court judges. However, what we must always understand, 
is this. We must do this in a way that seeks to protect these institutions so that we do not destroy them. Because if we do not have institutions, we are going to be in trouble. Very finally, when you have a petition of the kind that you have seen before the JSC, when a judge has been alleged to have misconducted himself in specific terms, okay, I will urge this, this nation, don't be in a hurry to condemn those judges. Because Steve and I are lawyers. We represent even people who have been um, alleged to have committed egregious crimes all over the country. And the Constitution says these people are innocent until they have been proven guilty. And so long as these judges are given due process, in which they are given an opportunity to respond to each and every allegation, and after the process, if the JSC finds, or if the tribunal that will be established to probe into the conduct of these judges finds that there was actually misconduct in the, on the part of the judges, whose result or whose logical conclusion is for them to be removed from office, then we'll have absolutely no problem. Okay. What we do not want to do is to suffer what we call predetermination, you know? That the judiciary has gotten to a point where it knows that if I am taken to the uh, Judicial Service Commission, the Judicial Service Commission has already predetermined that any judge who's brought before us or magistrate who's brought before us is already guilty. That the tribunal that will be established will only be a rubber stamp of the allegations that have been made. That is going to be a big problem in this country. And so what we can do is remove the politicization that we are seeing from these cases. Let every person handle their role in the process properly. Okay. The very last thing I want to say about the DPP. The DPP has been given a very important office. And this office has two responsibilities in my view. The first one is to determine whether on the basis of the facts before him and the evidence, he can see that an offense has been disclosed which can be taken for trial. Okay? And then on the basis of the evidence that has been given, number two, that this evidence can actually sustain a prosecution. And where he finds that both are lacking, then he should not go to prosecution. He should tell the, the inspector general to instruct the DCI to go and get better evidence I mean, okay. so that this can be done. The DCI, the, the, the pro, DPP, cannot leave that function of an independent office and start taking evidence to the Judicial Service Commission. Okay. Steve. We, we have a few minutes on the clock. Just to sum up this now, how do we now ensure that that integrity with what's happening is protected? Well, Ken, in terms of administration of justice, the judiciary is at the center of Kenya's justice system. The Supreme Court, particularly, is at the epicenter of Kenya's justice system because judges are the formal repositories of justice. If you have a dispute, you take it to the court there has to be a critical balance. What we are seeing in terms of deepening accountability is a welcome consequence of the Constitution. Judges must realize and must remain open to it that people will question their professional and personal conduct, you know, to see whether they match the promise of the Constitution. But judges also need not to be afraid. They need not to be overly cautious. They need not to be worried about the plethora of applications or petitions pending before the JSC. There's a procedure there that is anchored in law, actually a three-step process. First step, upon receipt, is to refer this matter to a committee for consideration. Second step is to have the entire commission consider it. Third step is to have, the, if to, is to have a tribunal if necessary. And even, even beyond the tribunal, the judge still has an opportunity to appeal the Supreme Court. You know, again, it's the decision made by the tribunal, if the tribunal were to find, you know. But what I'm saying is this. I'm against subjecting judges. You know, there's a wave of there's some kind of euphoria of removal of judges, whether it's because it's merited or maybe because it's just a whimsical decision someone is making because the, the law permits it. We will wait, we'll have to await the evidence that, that, that the JSC is considering. Be it as it may, our judiciary is the only institution that can be trusted fully to hold the fabric of this nation together. And I say that with clarity of mind. The political elite always look at the judiciary 
based on convenience. If it is convenient to support the judiciary, they will do so. If it is convenient to attack it, they will do so. Kenyans must be alive to that fact that political lenses keep on changing. Judicial lenses are shaped by fidelity to the law. We must not lose fact of that. Even as we consider all these matters around the judiciary, that for me is what I would consider as the parting shot. All right. Um, we have a minute to the clock, so we, we take... Uh, if you can speak it in a one, minute, one that's minute. okay. Yes. I want to look uh, David, uh, Chief Justice David Morales in the face and tell him this. He has to separate very carefully his role as uh, the President of the Supreme Court from his uh, role as Chairman of the JSC. And uh, even in terms of strategic communication, let Kenyans be able to see that the man now speaking is the President of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and the man now talking the is the Chairman of the, chairman of the Judicial Service, Service Commission. Commission. And I think he needs to develop a very solid team within his framework, so as to ensure that these things come out in the way they should. But most importantly, we have a principal judge of the High Court. Let that principal judge of the High Court be seen to be doing something when it comes to matters of the High Court. Let us see the President of the Court of Appeal doing something instead of him embodying the totality of communication about the judiciary. It will overwhelm him, it will put egg on his face, and it will take away that particular high place where the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya is supposed to pedestal for okay. purposes of giving respect to the judiciary. All right. Good place to end our discussion on the judiciary this morning. Thank you very much, Steve Ogola, and thank you very much, uh, James Mamboleo, for sharing your thoughts with us. This is a conversation that must continue. In fact, I'm going to speak to my producers, my bosses, if we can discuss this next week on Sidebar. Thank you for coming. And uh, time now for a short break. When we come back, the CS Water, Simon Chelugui, joins us in studio. And uh, we also have James Angawa and Dati, who is uh, Operation Support uh, from World Vision, also joining us in studio. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Let's bring back the discussion about the judiciary back to studio. And Steve Ogola still joins me and James Mamboleo. I'd like us to draw the line because a lot of people, what he was saying about the Chief Justice um, distinguishing himself from the Chief Justice, from the Chair of uh, uh, the Judicial Service Commission and the President of the Supreme Court, it's a little bit difficult to draw the line. But yesterday when the Chief Justice stood there, Steve, and spoke, and one of the names he read as having received a petition, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you're wondering, but this is you talking about you, yes, you know. Yes. So how do you draw that line as the Chief Justice? And do we, do we expect him to recuse himself, for example? You know, the Constitution itself requires the Chief Justice and all judges to read the law in a manner that depends its intended purpose. The Chief Justice must disperse power. He must disperse power. And as James said, and I agree fully, we have the principal judge, the High Court, we have the President of the Court of Appeal, we have the President of the Supreme Court. These three institutions must have equal opportunity to speak for those institutions. You get. You can't hold power in one person and say, since I'm the spokesman of the judiciary, this is, I'm going to read all this statement. In any case, as you've already pointed out, there is already a petition pending against the Chief Justice. It is going to be a very uncomfortable place to be at, as, as the chairman of the JSC, you know, to be coming back and reading a recommendation for purposes of demonstration, recommending his, you know, his you know, formation of a tribunal. So necessarily, by common sense alone, the Chief Justice would have to find someone like this, the Secretary of the JSC, to be the person reading the media, the media communications. Mm. He must disperse. Something we, we, we saw a lot in Gladys Soleil. Yes, he, he does. He, he, he must. Say Mutunga yes. reading statements. So, so we can't overemphasize uh, over this. The Chief Justice must take this as a positive development. Good point. He must give the principal judge opportunity to speak to matters involving the judges of the High Court. He must give the judge, the president of the Court of Appeal, to speak to issues involving the Court of Appeal. And then he can speak for the Supreme Court. Then we have to get someone else, like the secretary, the JSC speaking, or maybe another commissioner speaking on matters involving judges of the Supreme Court at the JSC. So that, that, that is inexcusable now. He has not done so, but he should do so. There's need to start doing that. And yes. James, um, we know for these investigations to begin, the chairman of the Judicial Service Commission, assuming he's not touched by any of the allegations, forms the sub committee of the Judicial Service Commission. When it comes to him, what will happen? Who forms this? Uh, because we know even the DCJ is somewhere mm -hmm. fighting for her own survival. 
when that matter of uh, an investigation into or when discussing the petition against the Chief Justice comes before the JSC, I expect that the rules will be followed and the rules command that mm -hmm. uh, the Chief Justice David Maraga will uh, uh, get out of the room and leave mm -hmm. the rest of the membership of the Judicial Service Commission discussing a question with regard to his own conduct. And if that um, committee comes up with uh, a finding that there is indeed a, a ground that has been established uh, the, to warrant the formation of uh, a tribunal to investigate him, of course then that the, the process should follow. But what is important is, uh, I think what we need to tell Kenyans is this, and we need also to address the Judicial Service Commission. The, the members of the Judicial Service Commission now sit at a very critical point in the history of the development of the judiciary in this country. It doesn't matter by whatever means somebody got appointed to the Judicial Service Commission as a member. What is, it, what is important and critical right now is that they must dispense with the responsibilities of the office of the member of the Judicial Service Commission with the highest level of objectivity and integrity, taking into account that these matters that are coming before mm. them have a serious public participation question, mm. and they have a serious public interest, so that they are seen to have done justice, and they actually do justice to the judges who will, whose cases will come before them. So I expect that they will be extremely calm and collected. They will call um, this evidence in a very objective manner, knowing that the threshold for meeting the kind of allegations that are before those uh, judges is extremely high. And then they will give the judges or magistrates an opportunity to present their cases in counterposition to the cases that have been brought before the Judicial Service Commission. So that finally, when that subcommittee of the Judicial Service Commission comes up with a recommendation for the formation of a tribunal, for instance, to probe the conduct of a judge of the Supreme Court or a judge of the Court of Appeal or a judge of the High Court, it is a recommendation that is beyond reproach. Okay, great. Uh, let's move this conversation and let's discuss, um, my, call me a conspiracy theorist, but I want you to tell me this. One, we had uh, Mohammed Wasami taking too long to be sworn in as part of the Judicial Service Commission, right? Right now, the main conversation going around the election of the LSK male representative to the Judicial Service Commission is a hold of that body, right? That will appoint judges. Then now, we are also witnessing an onslaught on the judges. Now, it means the judges will need to be removed. We'll have to get other judges in. Looking at the consistency of what's happening, the intimidation and all, it points to a deliberate drive to control the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Tell me if I'm wrong. Let me begin with Steve. I know Ken, you're right. The thing is this, unless you're a visitor into this country, Everybody knows that the politics of recomposition of the JSC and the Supreme Court itself is of, is of paramount interest to the ruling elite. They have an interest on who sits at the JSC and they have an interest on who sits at the Supreme Court. Obviously, because the JSC will interview judges that will replace Ojuang. Ojuang does not need a petition to begin with because he's going to go home anyway next year by operation of law. Justice Maraga is also going home by operation of law. These two won't be there by 2022. Their replacement will be done by JSC. If it, if it is open to politicians, and politicians will try to, 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 you know, to stretch that opportunity to influence who is elected there, you know, then they will do so. But what I think Kenyans must be cautious about is this. Kenyans, during the interrogation, because the interviews will be done publicly, even if the JSC had a preferred candidate, assuming for purposes of reconstituting the court ahead of 2022, Kenyans should come out and document their grievances or their concerns concerning those, over those candidates, you know, who are going to be appointed to replace the CJ and Justice Ojuan. But also for judges already serving, Kenyans must also not relent. Remember, part of the critical pillars undergirding the constitution is public vigilance. Public vigilance means that you must always interrogate the actions done by state and public officers and call them to account. The more you question, 
the more they become, over time, the more they become responsive to the organizing philosophy of the constitution, which means using that office to advance public benefit. So questioning, interrogating must always be part of our lived reality. The politics of composition will always be there. I believe those people, the law has set out the criteria for the LSK male representative. You have to be, the core, the core requirement is that you must be an advocate that has served at least 15 years experience as an advocate and you must be in good standing, you know. Whether now you have two people who are in good standing or four people who are in good standing and are qualified to be elected, whether now the preference is made one over the other may in fact be external issues, but ultimately, once we have the male representative in that commission, once we have the commission properly constituted, remember, if JB is removed, or if, if, he, or if he retires by operation of law, and CJ Maraga, again we'd have to replace them. We'd have to replace the Chief Justice you know, at the Supreme Court, and then we'd have to replace him also at the commission. So JSC will also, the, the composition of JSC will keep on changing as we head towards 2022, but I think what is dependent on us as Kenyans is to try and find a way of documenting your grievances against these people who, are, who want to be in the JSC, against judges. And then take you it know. where? You know, you know I, I have a background of public interest litigation. Usually, when you document grievances, the fact that you're bringing grievances from the public, from the private spaces to the public spaces, that itself is a success. Okay. If you're mapping successes, you know, it shows that you are relentless. The fact that you can speak out, speak about it, that itself must be marked as success. Number two, the fact that history will record this. Okay. You know, history will record, for instance, that J.B. Ojuang declined an invitation to appear before the JSC, and as a consequence, they recommended a tribunal. Okay. Whether the tribunal succeeds or not, that's another matter. It's so they must come out, mm -hmm. do it document, they must press for their removal if there is merited. So this is part of the democratic maturation process. Okay. Our process will mature over time. But communication and vigilance are key pillars mm -hmm. that undergird our constitution and we can't relent. And, and what I've just realized from looking at a tweet here by Nelson Harvey, one of the advocates, um, basically, apart from uh, Justice Lenaola, all of them have petitions, yes. which can yes. go either way, right? And if at all it goes the other way and they all leave, ultimately the new JAC will have to bring in new judges. Yes. Yes, lending credence yes, to what we're talking about. I, I, am not, um, I, I am not an advocate for my former professor, um, J.B. Ojuan, but I want to correct some position which probably my, Steve, my friend Steve has put across. I don't think that J.B. Ojuan rejected or declined to appear, to appear before the judges because if he sent his counsel, that was appearance. And I think it should be regarded as such that if you send your counsel to represent you before the JSC, uh, the only thing they can say is, uh, w of course, we have questions which we wanted to direct at your, your clients or your client, uh, but be that as it may, if it is you who is here, try and answer them to the best of your ability. Or if we have further questions, please go and seek further instructions on how to respond to them. But having said that, um, I agree with my colleague Steve that... Uh, politicians and other people of influence will always want to put a hand in who gets into uh, very influential positions like the position of a member of the Judicial Service Commission, uh, who sits in the Supreme Court, and who sits in a critical other number of institutions for purposes that are very ordinary, which is uh, they might have one interest or the other, which comes before any of these institutions from time to time. And they want to be sure that the person sitting there is a person who will represent, uh, their, interest. represent their interest. Even in the United States, the president is allowed some, um, s some leeway to appoint to the Supreme Court some the judges, judges yes. who hold a similar thinking to his. Because without that, you, you, are, likely not, you, you are likely to uh, fail in pushing certain things. But having said that, I want to say this. I do not think, in my view, uh, Ken, and uh, probably unfortunately, that Kenyans have any role to play on who becomes the member of the JSC or who becomes uh, the, 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 if, the, the public a, a judge representative of, 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 is and a presidential even the, appointee. Even the public representative <laughs> to JSC yes, is a presidential the, appointee. The, the man and woman mm -hmm. who represents the public in JSC mm -hmm. are all appointees of the executive through some process. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say this. 
So long as the people who get appointed to these positions, by whichever way they are appointed, that's what, what I said earlier, by whichever way they get there, they should know that they have risen to a position in which they will have to shed off some of their political, economic, or social biases and put the country first. Of course, we cannot take away completely that the fact that influences are going to play upon them as they go about their processes, but they should give the impression to the public that they are doing this thing right. Now, coming to a very important question, the appointment of uh, judicial service commission members and the appointment of people to serve uh, in, the, in the Supreme Court or in the courts generally. And this is where I want to disagree with anyone who probably advised the president not to appoint those members upon mm -hmm. uh, them being nominated for those or elected for those positions. Mm -hmm. As the president of the Republic of Kenya, I agree that the president sitting in the vintage position he sits in with the kind of information he has, he may, not, he may know that probably this person is not or does not possess the, the, the sufficiently high level of integrity required for that particular position. But for as long as a legal process, process set out in the Constitution has resulted in one Ken Mijungu, then I would advise that the President will have no option but to appoint them. And even if, for instance, today, and this is what I would advise the President even today, if, for instance, Professor uh, Tom Ojeda was elected as the male representative of the LSK to the Judicial Service Commission, mm. the president should have absolutely no problem appointing him to that position. Okay. He shouldn't wait for the, for, for, the, for the same thing that happened to Justice Warsame, so that the, he goes to court, so that the court uh, deem that this person has been appointed anyway, mm -hmm. whether or not the okay. president has appointed. So we have to distinguish clearly what is entirely constitutional legal process from political processes. The president might not like me, but if I have been appointed pursuant to a legal process, he should he appoint should me. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. that if the president feels strongly or whoever advises the president feels strongly that there is a bone or two to pick with this particular person, that they can't raise it. There is a procedure also laid out for throwing out a member of the JSC or throwing out a member or, or, or a, a judge of the Supreme Court or any other court. And okay. I think those are the procedures that we should develop. Great. Steve, parting shot. We have to let you go. You have been here longer than uh, you have outlived your time. So your parting shot um, going forward? Well, I think um, in terms of comparative thinking, because Kenya is, not, Kenya is part of the global family of nations, and when you're looking at our governance system, it also benefits us to look at it comparatively. It is known world over that with new constitutions, however robust they may be, challenges of implementation will always be there. And part of those challenges is that the office holders and the political leaders may not be immediately open to complying with the transformative vision under the constitution. So when we realize this, because this is what Kenya is going through, what you may call it a period of constitutional turbulence, you may call it a period of just open, open disobedience, of the new philosophy and trying to reinstate through the back door the old philosophy where the executive reigns supreme, parliament reigns supreme, and the judiciary is cornered, and the people have no voice, you know. Whatever case may be, Kenyans must understand that in terms of governance, you cannot dispense the requirement for public vigilance. You can't. Because the constitution will not bring itself into urgent maturation. It will be an ongoing debate a long drawn process of review, conversations, dialogue, calling out leaders, pointing out the mistakes, we must do so rel relentlessly, if only to document in history in at a point in time that in 2019, this is what Kenyans were saying. So it's part, of, it's, part of, it's part of our democratic setup. I want to make a passionate appeal to the leaders, our elected leaders. Could you please have a culture, a matching culture of compliance? Try and limit, you know, the temptation or resist the temptation to influence or interfere with independent organs and offices, even for whatever reason. Because ultimately, even the political elite will have to be succeeded anyway. Okay. You're not going to have Uru Kinyata forever, mm -hmm. the Rilo Dingas, the William Rutos. In the future, 
We could have President James Mamboleo here. That so would be good. He should, pick, be good he should pick up from mm -hmm. a place. He shouldn't be battling with things that should have been done 10 years ago. Let us have a culture of compliance. Let us disinherit the culture of bad manners, dishonesty, disrespect of his key institutions for us to be able to say, since 2010, these are the gains that you've consolidated. Okay. The next team will pick it from there. Can, okay. can just one minute? Yes. To, to first agree with Steve entirely that I would, uh, we'll make, a, I would make a, a, a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic president. Kenyans will really love it. Now, <laughs> having said that, um, I, I want to look uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta in the face and David Maraga and Justin Muturi and the people who lead the three arms of government. And I want to tell them that at the end of the turmoil that we are seeing in these institutions, we must, we must get to a place where Kenyans will say that serious challenges beset the judiciary, serious challenges beset the executive, serious challenges beset parliament. But the leadership led Kenyans in a way that is satisfactory. The leadership followed the constitution. The leadership followed the law. Okay. Because if we if we move out of the constitution and the law, even if it is for just a little while, mm -hmm. even if it is for just a little convenience, we will be setting a dangerous place, a, a dangerous precedent okay. from which we might never recover. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. And now I have to let you go for real. James Mambole and Steve Ogolo, always a pleasure. And uh, have a good day. Thank you for watching.